Um, and thank you for inviting me here to be part of this event today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I would like to start at the next part of the session where we're actually going to look at the perspectives from both the public and private sector. But before we get into the panel discussion, I would like to invite Pierce O'Donoghue to the stage, uh, who is the Director for Future Networks from DG Connect and the European Commission. And he will provide an opening statement that will help put some perspective on our discussion to follow. Pierce, welcome. Thank you very much, Claire, and good afternoon to everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's, it's great to be back with you. Uh, and I would indeed like to address some of the issues that we've just heard about, which are so important to the Commission. Um, so, dear colleagues, uh, I would like to start by refreshing the Commission's commitment uh, to, to uh, open source technologies, open technologies, as was just said, um, for our economy, as well as for the robustness and autonomy of that economy in a, a competitive, but also geopolitically unstable world. But let's start with a positive, perhaps a slightly old example for most of you, because you're so involved in this community. But the best high performance computers of the world are running on open source components and Linux, the kernel is powering the internet, as it were, its servers and the devices that connect to it. So even as we see in the tragic events in Ukraine, uh, attempts to cut uh, uh, off internet access, it is one of the elements that contributes to the robustness of the internet, that it can be um, decentralized and therefore it can be partly self-repairing. Uh, and that is one of the many uh, attractions that we have from an open source approach. And it is things like that that, of course, change uh, perceptions about open source even today. And so now, I think with the study and, and what we're going to discuss, we have to really ask how can open source contribute to open strategic autonomy? And as I would say, or stress open strategic digital autonomy, uh, if you'll allow me that phrase. Um, now, of course, we're only interested in it if it can maximize the value for European citizens and businesses, while at the same time protecting our society and values. But we are convinced that open source is a key instrument for, for Europe's digital autonomy. It increases competition in key digital sectors and it improves competitiveness. And at the same time, it also supports the digital transformation of society. And that's a question which this commission has been focusing on, and you will be aware of the, the number of uh, initiatives which you have taken. And it's not just a question of how to achieve the transformation, but also to ensure that in doing it, uh, uh, we, we are careful as to how it is done. So take, you know, as prime examples, for example, the protection of personal data. That's a well rehearsed um, example and one that I will actually come back to. But also, what about the protection of the environment, for example, where we have to ensure that digital technologies are not only respecting um, their environmental responsibilities and helping to meet our Green Deal objectives as an industry or as a set of industries, uh, including, of course, carbon efficiency, but how does uh, open source help all sectors of the economy and society reduce their carbon footprint? And that's how we have to look at all of these challenges of transformation. So when I listen with great interest to the report that's just been presented, we, we do have to address technological dependency. And we have to address supplier dependency, which do, as I think I understood from the presentation, have different uh, characteristics and therefore require slightly different approaches. But together, we have to say, what are the best actions to overcome these dependencies and to actually achieve our transformation goals? So open source has, of course, many strengths, which you are familiar with. Uh, and it does change the way that we think about policymaking. You know, how do we, for example, think of cybersecurity of open source, uh, which has changed and matured recently? But how do we scrutinize, say, artificial intelligence, which is powered by open source? Uh, when we are focused more and more on that as a driver for the operation of entire computing ecosystems as well as our communications networks. So open source, as opposed to proprietary approaches to, for example, artificial intelligence, or even to cybersecurity itself, 
will make a um, very significant difference to the way in which we then ensure that there is societal control, that there is an awareness and transparency about what is happening, but also so that uh, we can benefit from these technologies and not be slaves to them. Because we want open source to help, uh, as it can be, to support our autonomy. Um, now, that includes getting leadership where we are at the moment, perhaps lagging behind. But it's also about exploiting the natural advantages, the natural leadership that we have here in Europe. So, uh, as I referred already once to personal data, if you take our approach uh, to personal data or to other societal issues like disinformation, we can see that having an open source approach will indeed help us to have greater transparency and certainty while not actually having to interfere with the technology as may be the case if we were dealing, dealing with entirely proprietary standards or technologies. At the same time, we can lead by example because we can, with our values, we can use this open source approach in ensuring that they are hard baked into the technology and that therefore we, while supporting European values and norms, are setting a high standard which uh, we reward those who respect those high standards. We do not allow others to undercut those standards by breaking the rules. Uh, and that means that on a global level, we are leading by example, improving the human-centric nature of our technologies, setting high social and moral standards, but at the same time, in a very cold um, business sense uh, or logic as well, we are actually giving ourselves an economic and competitive advantage. But I'd like to dwell a bit more on those values because the European digital strategy that we are driving in the Commission does look to have people put at the centre of a fair and competitive digital economy. Uh, whether it's basic issues such as freedom or democracy or equality, but also simply consumer rights uh, and the ability of others to enter a market. These are all elements which uh, underpin uh, a sustainable digital society and they are the society, that is the type of society which, which Europe wants. But we have to be realistic and as I heard Silan say very clearly, to gain scale we have to work together. We have to be realistic about the abilities of individual smaller European companies to themselves take on some of the giants in order to develop a foothold in the markets, in order to be able to promote and push uh, open computing, open hardware, open electronics, open science, whatever the, the technology is. Those open technologies, the phrase that, that Sivan used repeatedly, uh, lead me to think about open hardware, which we don't talk about as much, but open hardware platforms are developing fast. And that represents another form of modularity. It re represents another form of transparency. And by the way, will be increasingly important as once again, we completely lock together our transformation goals of digital on one side, but linked and interlocked with the green transformation objective that we have as well, where open source hardware will actually contribute and allow us again as a society to have transparency about what the equipment is made of, how it's working and how it's disposed of afterwards. So those are some of the key issues that we look at. And I, I, I heard quite a few uh, resonances in the, in the report that's been presented. And uh, what we have to remember is that uh, when I hear though about access to critical technologies, perhaps we have to go beyond that. It's not just a question of access. It's also about being involved uh, in their development and of course their use. So as well as being autonomous, we have to be influential. We have to ensure that we do actually bring others with us with regard to the standard process, the standardization process for open source. Uh, it means that we don't want to be independent if that means being isolated, if that means creating silos. Because in fact, what we want is to benefit globally from this digital ecosystem and we want others to benefit from the work that we are doing. So uh, interconnected, uh, or even interdependent is, is just as important as the autonomy part of what is a key part of the European strategy. I have to mention lastly, before I stop, just the question of cybersecurity. It's always raised. Sometimes it is raised as, uh, as an issue 
by those who are not keen on an open source approach. I think in uh, recent years, the open source community has shown robustly how secure uh, and in fact, uh, how many advantages in terms of uh, security the open source approach presents. But we have to maintain that security. We have to maintain that robustness and ensure that it is not used to undermine the values that are referred to. But in the current uh, crisis that we are in, we see once again that the ability of the whole community using standards or technologies that are transparent to assist in uh, the situation such as that in Ukraine is something that we would like to see reproduced elsewhere. So to conclude, open source will help Europe to become more autonomous. Uh, it represents an area where we are and can be a leader. And of course, it is an area which by uh, taking an altruistic approach, it contributes directly to the improvement, to the competitiveness and the welfare of Europe as a whole, and not just the company or the sector that you are working in. Uh, and that is why we welcome today's report. I'm very happy to have I had the opportunity to speak to you once again, and I do look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pierce, for those opening words. Um, it was it was great to hear your perspective for the discussion that is about to come. So at this point in time, I would like to invite on stage our virtual panel. So that is, please welcome, in fact, uh, Vittoria Bertola, who's Head of Policy and Innovation for Open Exchange. And folks, you can wave as, as you come on, just so that we can we can know who people are, though you've been very helpful and actually you all put your names in. So thank you very much for that. But welcome, Vittorio. Uh, we have Marco Alexander Bright, who's the Deputy Director General for Artificial Intelligence, Data and Di Digital Technologies at the Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Hello, Marco Alexander. Uh, we've got Deborah Bryant, who's the Senior Director of the OSPO at Red Hat. Hi, Deb. And we have Mike Linz Linksfair, who's the Head of Developer Policy at GitHub. Welcome, Mike. So thank you all for joining us here today. We have heard some amazing and really interesting report from Savan in terms of the discussion around digital autonomy. We have also heard some great statements from Pierce around the perspective of the European Commission. So now we're going to have a look specifically in this panel at um, perspectives from the private sector, thinking about both the problems that they um, raised and also potentially some of the solutions that were suggested and to get your perspectives on that. So Let's start today with uh, Vittorio, because you are representative of the European tech company. Um, so in the context of the discussion around competitiveness and scaling up and competing in the global digital market, being a European company, how do you formulate this kind of idea of, of a problem? How do you think about digital autonomy from your perspective? Well, first of all, thanks for inviting us. I mean, we, we are uh, actually uh, one of the not so many European internet SMEs. And I mean, you can formulate this problem in many different ways that we could talk about financing, scaling and so on. But I'd like to focus on a couple of things that are more relevant to, to what we are discussing in terms of autonomy. So I'd say that uh, we still have as European SMEs uh, challenges in, in accessing markets. And uh, these challenges are mostly connected to, well, dominant positions that we all know, but also to a sort of a dependent mindset that in Europe we still have, I mean, we still depend uh, on how the internet industry has developed in other parts of the world, like I mean, the US, of course, but also China. So we, we see this in, in also in the policies that we see. We, we, we see, for example, the, still too many parts of the European ecosystem and policy ecosystem looking for the unicorn, which is a, a good mandate. So, I mean, uh, everybody expects and asks, why don't we get a new Google in, in Europe? And that's fine. We, we hope we can get something like that, but Europe doesn't work like that. So uh, Europe is, is rather like a, an archipelago of countries, of nations, of languages that produces horizontal alliances between SMEs. So maybe if we as like a German company, we are present in many countries, but maybe not in all the European countries. So maybe we look for a local partner and we build an alliance. And, and this is how the internet market develops in, in Europe. And open source and open standards are really the only model that promotes this kind of horizontal cooperation. But also there is a, a lack of education, of laziness in the IT procurement people, especially at the lower level, more, more on the territory. So, I mean, there's people that say we, we've been using that proprietary solution for 30 years, and so we can just continue using that. And they don't think that, I mean, the fact they spend the money is, can or cannot create economy and, and growth and know-how locally in, in their own territory, depending on how they spend it. And so even if we have now like 20 years of policies for public money to create public code, still it's, it's not happening everywhere. 
And uh, still, I mean, the, there are people in the procurement environment that do not seem to get the weakness in strategic terms of having public services that are hosted outside of your local environment, of your local jurisdiction, maybe subject to laws by other countries that allow access to personal data. So these are challenges that are still not well understood by many procurement people. And, and then we have the actual dominant positions. And, and the dominant positions that we see in, in all the inter-niche, almost all the inter-niche now have a silo that, that is building a, a dominant position with, with few exceptions. And these are not just fueling the lessness, because of course, if you have to pick a service, you will pick the dominant one. These are not just influencing the future, because then the, the companies that have a dominant position will control the culture of the standardization organization and the design of the future technologies. And we'll ensure that, I mean, we will still continue to build this kind of over the top encrypted centralized silos that contribute to further dominant positions in the hands of all, I mean, the same very few big companies that operate globally. But I mean, actually these dominant positions just make it impossible or very hard to enter new markets. So to make an example, we, we are a company that makes, uh, we, we make web mails, web mail platforms or DNS services. and and uh, so some of the big telcos in Europe use our webmail platform. And maybe we would like to allow the, the final users of these webmail platforms to also send the instant messages. But we cannot because all the, the instant messaging world is made of these silos that basically do not allow third parties to exchange messages with their users because they want to keep them closed in the silo so that they, they are not subject to competition, basically. So they escape competition by closing down the, the silos. And so this is why we need the regulatory intervention. So we, of course, we have been active in looking at the digital market. Markets Act and now the, the Data Act, all these new things that, I mean, we, we have hope that we will get some of the solutions. We will get the interoperability that we need to allow, for example, to, for a service like ours to, uh, to send messages to instant messaging users or maybe exchange social media messages or these kind of things. And this can create innovation, can allow I mean, new companies to start up, not just the existing one. But what we see is that, that there's... I mean, we, we seem to be getting too little too late to use a, a very <laughs> internal terminology in terms of business. So it, it's, it's striking that we've been having in Europe heavily regulated ISP telco industries for a, a lot of time. And so interoperability and switching in, in this kind of industries is easy for the final user now. But for some reason, we cannot get the same in internal services. And this is really something that I can't explain. So I, I hope that we, we will get it in the, in the near future. Thank you. Thank you, Vittorio. I, lo I, lo I love your analogy about the fact that, that 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 we shouldn't necessarily be always looking for unicorns. It's it's you know, unicorns and rainbows isn't isn't necessarily what we're looking for here. And I think the opportunity that was described earlier in terms of the SME market and and how you know we have the potential to provide you know really really valuable services in you know twenty six languages and with very specific requirements for each particular jurisdiction is one that we should we should definitely uh, take advantage of. Um, and I really liked your point about the regulation around this idea of making it necessary to actually uh, wouldn't it be great if it was uh, open so that it would actually allow for, for folks and SMEs to get more involved even easier than it is at the moment. Um, and so with that, and thinking about that global aspect and the global market and how to enter into that, um, I might come to you, Deb, because you're from a global company um, uh, and thinking about Red Hat and the global market. Can you perhaps comment about this idea of, you know, technology lock-in, supplier lock-in, how open technologies can, can help Con, you know, um, counter th those kinds of challenges. Yeah, absolutely. So thanks for the opportunity. Uh, Stefan made a number of deep comments uh, on, the, on the status of, of this. So I don't want to repeat a lot of the, the valuable uh, content he provided in terms of today's software world and, and, uh, and, and the rising star of op open source. But we do know that the last decade has brought uh, radical changes in acceleration and adoption. And in particular, the last several years of the pandemic have really greatly accelerated the adoption and participation of software communities in all sectors of society. And I will say, as we continue our panel discussion, I would suggest that the key for Europe may be all sectors of society, where, uh, where the US, where Red Hat started, uh, is, has been a software economy for a long time, may have left other sectors behind in terms of academia, research, and and uh, and civil society. We're, we're seeing that catch up, but I think Europe has, has an advantage there in terms of the way they've thought about certain things. Uh, when Red Hat started 30 years ago, they really stood alone as the only vendor that was doing commercial support. That's dramatically changed, but that, uh, that original model for engineering, uh, that original model for the business still remains today. 
right? And so we, I think it's been a proof point to suggest that a company can keep its code open and still provide value to its customers and its stakeholders. I think this is very important and that cognitive dissonance we have to get through about, you know, commercializing or providing commercial support and value into an open ecosystem is something that companies will become successful with as, as they adopt that model on any scale, whether they're a unicorn, a, a rare company or a small company, it's the same ecosystem. And so there's an equal opportunity to take advantage of a major global asset to do that, uh, that kind of work. And I think it just goes without saying that, uh, that this kind of approach uh, enables the the notion of digital autonomy, being able to participate, to choose to uh, change your technology stack or decide you want to participate yourself, you're unhappy with your vendor, or you can change a vendor. These kinds of open standards and interoperability that open source brings really, uh, really does level the playing field in a different way that allows all, all, all levels of, of at least commercial participation, uh, let alone uh, uh, collaboration in, in civil, uh, civil society. Thanks. Thanks, Deb. And, um, you know, I think you're dead right about the idea. Isn't it wonderful that you can provide the value on the, in the perspective of actually giving people more autonomy and influence over the technology, as well as the security that something is supported and that they have they have someone to call if something goes wrong. So um, it, it is definitely seems to be a model that 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 should should and could be leveraged much more widely um, for, for all organizations, big or small, as you mentioned. So next, I'll come to you, Mike, um, from GitHub's perspective, because you've been engaged as well in open source and policy for many years. So from your perspective, how do you see this framing of the problem from an open tech perspective? Yeah, thanks. And I guess start off by uh, endorsing what Deb uh, led off with lots of deep insights from Sivan and as well as from person and in, in the report as well. I really encourage everybody to read that. And from a kind of open policy perspective, it's, it's um, I think everybody here really gets it, but I see kind of two naive tensions. If it were one hearing about digital sovereignty, you might think this is kind of a nationalistic take and doesn't, and it's actually a threat to open and collaboration. But if you understand the open strategic autonomy, the, the criticality of open, it's, it's not about that at all. And from an open perspective, historically open policy has been very, very focused on copyright and just having the necessary permissions to be able to you know, study, modify, share, run software. I think what brings, what, what sort of makes those uh, seemingly, or those kind of naive initial takes come together is really the notion that you need capability, you need to develop capability in order to um, actually achieve strategic autonomy and to take advantage of those uh, freedoms and access that you naturally have to open source software. And I think the sort of private sector journey really kind of underlines that and will be greatly expanded um, by the public sector and policy journey of kind of initially seeing open source as something to be feared or not understood, and then kind of as just kind of a free resource. And companies uh, and other organizations have really that, that are really leveraging open source are doing so by participating and following best practices, most obvious one, working with upstream and kind of institutionalizing that through the development of, of OSPOs. And I think that that can all be adopt, you know, is being adopted, you know, at the, in the public sector. But I think it becomes much more interesting because the public sector has broader goals than do, than do companies. So to kind of, account for openness to see openness kind of as as a policy tool across a bunch of different sectors um and you know pierce donahue really um highlighted a number of those um so i think that that is going to that kind of engagement from the public sector is going to increase the size of open source and you know create a lot of cultural change and and even conflict that I think is going to be healthy. And I think we can also see that from private sector engagement with open source over the last 10 plus years that um, you know corporates are corporations are kind of pursuing their own goals but also um, contributing mightily to the growth of open source. And I think that you know the same thing is going to happen with government engagement with 
you know, pursuing own goals, making sure that that public sector values are part of the open source community. And that's going to make us all um, going to make us all uh, stronger in the end. Thank you for that. And, and I love, I mean, personally, I love the idea that we might actually be able to get rid of the whole term of digital sovereignty or digital autonomy um, as a standalone term, because it does cause this confusion. But if we could replace it with open strategic digital autonomy, then I think that would be a, that would be a lovely, uh, a lovely change for, for us to have. So thank you for that. I'm also going to put a pin in your comment about the idea that having more people being involved and in contributing might actually cause um, a, a change in the ecosystem that might even cause a bit of conflict. So maybe we'll come back to that, actually and think about what that might mean for the broader open source community because it's an interesting one as well. But before we do, I want to hear from Marco Alexander because you work at the German Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action um, and Pierce, in fact, mentioned the link as well between um, the need for our, our goals and values for the EU to have a link between um, the digital goals as well as the green transition that we have to actually go through. Um, but can you maybe then comment about, in general, uh, about the digital competitiveness competitiveness issue and how open technologies may service that. And if you want to comment as well on the green transition as, as part of that, because of your background, that would be fantastic too. Yeah. Um, thank you, first of all, for having me this afternoon and a good afternoon to all of you. Um, I fully agree with a lot of um, um, you all said, but um, please give me the opportunity to kind of um, give my own point of view to some of these issues. The first of all, I think um, competitiveness and sovereignty, and in, in the German debate, it's sovereignty, and this um, gets confused with autonomy because autonomy is something very different in German and in French than autonomy and digital sovereignty. But um, let's stick to the autonomy um, discussion for a second because it shows the opaqueness and the, the ambiguity of the terms. Mm -hmm. In the end, um, this autonomy and competitiveness are two interlinked um, um, concepts. Competitive is competitiveness itself is not um, a, a goal that you, sh that you should strive for. In the end, it's what the things that competitiveness leads to is what you uh, aim for as a government. It's jobs and wealth, and the wealth is distributed in all of society. So in the end, competitiveness is just a measure of how much wealth can you, um, can you in, in the end, um, attribute to societal um, actors. And um, why is competitiveness interlinked with sovereignty? You can see it um, right now in these international affairs because reduced vulnerabilities and strengthened sovereignty go hand in hand. You take, for example, the product prices that all of us are, um, um, are using each and every day. They are highly dependent on the commodity prices and the commodity prices are highly dependent on energy prices. So in the end, um, we will, we are not able right now to really see how energy prices are going to be interlinked with product price and the competitiveness of goods being manufactured in the European Union. And you can even see, and this is way closer to our, what did, our background, we do not know yet how energy prices are going to relate to cloud computing prices. We will see a price hike in the next month, I assume, because otherwise um, the, the companies, especially the larger ones that have um, been relying on lock-in effects in the last years, how they are going to um, conceptualize or their, their their these energy prices within their own um, um, product. Um, so, what is digital autonomy and what is digital sovereignty from my point of view or from our point of view? It's not that we need to do everything by ourselves. It needs um, we need to be able to do whatever is needed by ourselves. So the concept of autonomy is not a nationalistic concept. It's kind of a safeguard against international crisis, as we see now. It's kind of a safeguard against dependencies that get right into the middle of your economic vulnerabilities. So um, again, it's not a nationalistic concept. It's closely interlinked with competitiveness, and it's closely interlinked with the welfare of all of us. So m second comment that I would like to make is how do we um, Get, and this is something Vittorio and um, Deborah uh, mentioned. How do we how do we make an, an ecosystem competitive? If you if you want to build tech, and this is my I'm a civil servant. Sorry for that, I'm not an entrepreneur, but this is my plain view. You need three things: you need bright people, you need money, and you need an ecosystem where bright people and the money find together, and you create opportunities for businesses to 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 um, to foster and for opportunities to kind of get the next big thing. And Europe, Victoria, it was a great, it was a great introduction. Um, it's um, it's um, it's highly federalized. 
its governments, its ecosystems, its tech bubbles. There is not one European tech bubble. There is a lot of tech bubbles in Berlin and Paris everywhere. And if I want to say, I want to set up an ecosystem, a physical ecosystem, and I think physical ecosystems are very, very worth, worth the effort, you will not get this in Europe. Why so? Because the French, they want it in Paris. The, the Germans, they want it in Berlin or in Munich. And the Italians want it in Florence. And you can count that for all the 27 member states, six um, others. Um, and so in the end, um, this physical ecosystem, that culminating point where opportunities, ideas, brains and money get together, uh, come together, it's, um, it's almost impossible for Europeans to achieve. But what we can do is kind of master the technique of fulfilling the promise of an ecosystem in a digital way. And this is something that we are trying to do with regulation, Data Act, for example, the D Data Governance Act, for example, the upcoming AI Act, for example, and it's something that we try to achieve with e um, with the um, 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 data with data availability and data spaces, for example, via the Gaia X initiative. So, um, I would like to emphasize the role of open source in all this. Why is open source so important? You all said that it, because it reduces the dependencies, but there is an opportunity here if we are able to set up the most important um, um, digital ecosystem in Europe on the basis of open source. We give the bright minds that really live the open source idea the opportunity to change the world. And as of now, there's companies, Deborah, that really do this on the, uh, really do this greatly. But there is we are still lacking this huge ecosystem that's not um, comprised of by only one company, but that's um, kind of um, attributes. The, the knowledge and the money and the brains for, via um, or through all the nations, through uh, small and medium enterprises, to big companies, and this ecosystem that really um, where these ideas can really strive. To promote this and to reduce vulnerabilities, as we have seen with Lock4 Shell, we are in Germany setting up a sovereign tech fund. We are in the process of um, trying to find out how to exactly we should, which angle we should uh, choose for uh, setting up such a funding and such a one-stop shop for open source ideas. But we are strongly committed to that via the new coalition treaty of the German of the new German government. And let me finish with one more um, one more thought. Um, right now, we see how important security is, especially if you really, really need it. And, um, and right now, um, we are in a situation where international affairs has shown us have shown us that we really, really need security. And cybersecurity is just one part of it. But the problem right now, from a European perspective, is that we actually lack this um, scalable or this big size scalable AI enhanced platform enhanced cybersecurity. Um, 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 company. There is a lot of them in the world. They are all in the United States. And if you talk about strategic autonomy, then we should think about cybersecurity probably too. And this is going to be um, one of the issues that we should address in the next four or five years, because otherwise we are having the cloud computing debate 2.0. Thank you. No, thank, thank you, Marco Alexandra, and thank you for making that distinction about um, how we can think about uh, autonomy and sovereignty in the context of just removing dependencies or any risk that we may have from, from that perspective. And then, so so thinking about that, and you, you yourself have mentioned some of the ideas that are happening in Germany, like the um, Sovereign Tech Fund, um, and even some ideas about where we might put it if, if cybersecurity might be one of those areas that might be a high priority. But but also now thinking back to what Savan mentioned in terms of his eight various different ideas ideas around uh, maybe looking at changing leadership culture to actually get engagement here, or for example, developing more OSPOs, or for example, um, you know, ma making sure to actually buy more SMEs, making that easier, that may actually have impact on procurement and things like that. Can I ask each of you now maybe to think about what you would recommend in order to reduce our dependency on any one supplier or, or, or you know, meta supplier or technology, but to enable this idea of a proliferation of more uh, European based solutions that might help reduce our dependency. So I'll go around again and, and maybe we'll just take the same order just to ask um, what what would be one idea that you think either from Savan's list or your other another idea that you would think that we should double down on in order to reduce that dependency, Vittorio? 
Well, as I was saying, I think that we really need to open up the internet again and prevent its centralization because the centralization is happening into the hands of companies that are not in Europe. And to make an example, I mean, that what we were, we were saying, we were talking about cybersecurity capabilities. Now, if you want to develop AI-based cybersecurity capabilities, at least for, for network attacks, you have to see the network. So you have to uh, ISPs and network operators that have access to at least certain features of the traffic of their users so that they, for example, can detect when... Uh, Computers are infected and they are spreading malware or botnets, or they can look into, I mean, for suspicious, uh, unusual traffic patterns and so. But now what is happening is that all the big internet platforms are pushing this model of an encrypted internet in which basically you have a, an, an operating system like in mobiles, which they control, or a device, I mean, a physical device, IoT device that they control, and they have servers in the cloud in, in the US or even in Europe, but servers that only they have, have access to. And there are encrypted channels that uh, make it so that the ISP doesn't even know where, whether there's a connection that is happening. I mean, even the DNS, which was a, tra a traditional point in which at least the, the ISP had some idea of where the users were going, it is now disappearing and going into this invisible encrypted, uh, which is which is good for privacy, maybe to a certain extent, except that maybe, I mean, these platforms uh, sometimes leave off uh, monetizing data. But, but, but basically, we're making all the European ISP and network operators going dark. And they have no way to see the traffic, so they have no way to build the cybersecurity capabilities. They're actually losing the ones that, that already exist. So, I mean, this is all interlinked. This is why I think we, we have to make thoughts at, at the architectural level for, of the future that we want to build over the network and the architecture we want to have over the network. And we have to have the strength to discuss this with the global platforms, uh, to a certain extent impose it, but at least, I mean, this is part of the sovereignty part. But, but uh, at least to discuss with them and, and find ways so that the European actors actually have access to the data they need. Okay, so so I'll take from that in terms of the open standards and open data, but noting the kind of tension between privacy and what people expect from that and, and the idea of, of encrypted privacy and all the rest of it. That's that's another whole conundrum that we could spend all day talking about, I'm guessing. Yeah. But 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 I hear it's you in not terms just of about privacy. Privacy. I mean, privacy is not a, I mean, encryption is not always about privacy because if no. you in encryptedly send your data to people that exploit them, you're losing privacy. So this that's is true too. An excuse. <laughs> no, thank you. But 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 I take I take from you the, the idea of having the open standards and, and open data and in order to be able to to regulate for that so that we do have that chance and that access to be able to innovate um is what I took from your, your comments. So thank you, Victoria. And um, Deborah, would you like to maybe comment on that from your perspective, what you think can be done or should be done as a first port of call in order to help uh, reduce dependencies and, and open things up? Well, I'll float an idea that's sort of in my swim lane, which uh, harkens back to the idea of OSPOs. Uh, that came out in OFE's recommendations a couple of years ago, but I didn't think it went far enough because it was just generic and mm -hmm. promoted the idea of ensuring that this was sort of Cross society, multi-tiered academia, um, uh, the public sector and, and the private sector, and if you play on this idea, think in in, in broad terms, uh, open source projects and initiatives have as a fundamental part of their success a governance model where each participant comes to the table with their agenda. It's not all the same, right? Each organization has different objectives, but the key thing is they're understood. And there's great power in understanding. So if you think of using a network of OSPOs as a strong tactic to enable this kind of collaboration and strengthen, then you uh, could have a situation where you're really looking at, uh, at this going forward as an economic development strategy, where you understand what universities need to move their, their issues forward. Because in the, the essential Part of this idea of creating an OSPO, what we really, what really needs to be called out is it's not the creation of the thing itself that's as valuable as the deliberative process of engaging the organization in speaking what their, their hidden or expressed interests are, what they think the value of being of participating in an open source ecosystem is, what they hope to gain, how they think they'll do that and to have concurrence where it's aligned with either the company's business goals, it's aligned with a, with a, with a civil society entity, a nonprofit, whatever their mission is. And I, I've, been, I've worked in each three of these sectors. I have great appreciation in the public sector. Our motivations are different, but we're all coming to the table of what we need. So my, my suggestion would be to really build a very robust network across Europe of OSPOs 
and, uh, and, and build a, uh, an ecosystem in that way. My colleague from Germany has mentioned that, you know, building a, a virtual kind of a, a ecosystem is really uh, incredibly important, not just because we're not still all meeting during the band pandemic, because nobody wants to debate where this where the center of gravity will physically be in any project. And fortunately, open source and its model has had the benefit of being ubiquitous and uh, and and global in that respect. Uh, and, and thank you for that. And, and I'd like to add that one of the things that has really drawn me to the open source ecosystem is this accessibility that from anywhere in the world um, that it allows for and not having to be at the center of any particular software hub, um, but also being able to contribute is a huge benefit. So thank you for, for calling that out. And, and also, I would imagine as well, from an OSPO perspective, there was some discussion earlier about the capability building. And, and one of the other great benefits OSPOs can provide is also being that 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 center for understanding the capability gaps that may be in any organization and then being able to help fill that. Um, would you mind just like maybe even just commenting on that as well? Because, you know, sometimes I, I wonder if if the capabilities required, say, in the public sector might be slightly different than in the private sector, or or do you see also that being an opportunity for OSPOS to co collaborate on? No, absolutely. In fact, even within, let's if you just take one sector like the uh, the, the private sector, the, the rationale and the purpose and what an open source program office does will vary. Our, ours is very different than Microsoft. You, so, so you may have a, a, a company or an institution that's really well versed in open source and, and the leadership is bought in or one. The mission may be trying to convince the rest of the company they need to come along and educate their engineers. That's not my job at Red Hat because all the engineers already know how to do this. But instead, we have you know, we have other uh, other concerns. So I would say that organizational development is always key for many OSPOs to make sure that there's education outreach at all levels of the company for for managers so they understand why it's important to give their employees time to participate in an open source community that doesn't you know apparently look like it's a straight line to product. Uh, it may be working with a legal team uh, on peer to bring along their understanding if that's not that depth. But you do have to, I think the OSPO's role is really to begin by indexing what the company's capability is and then understanding what their, those gaps are and developing a program that's specific to whether it's a public sector or, or a university playing on their strengths or a company. You need to build a plan according to where you, where you start. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, so, Mike, I'll come back to you now. Um, and and it's still sticking with me what you said earlier about the idea that, um, and even as I, I'm hearing uh, the discussion about capabilities building and everyone coming from a different perspective and how people's capabilities may differ. Um, so, thinking about if we are successful at this, and then there's an onslaught of additional new software developers into the open source ecosystem, wouldn't that be great? Yay! And um, with all these diverse backgrounds and needs, um, and perhaps coming with perhaps what might be a different set of values or regulations that they have to contend with at a local level. Um, you mentioned the idea that that might actually sometimes cause conflict in, in the ecosystems that they may be contributing to. I, I'm really interested to like dig a little deeper there. And, and do, do you see that as a, as a blocker, as something that can be um, uh, um, you know, uh, absorbed within the ecosystem? In short, yes, or, or in short, no, it's not a blocker. And yes, it can oh, be good. absorbed in the ecosystem. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think the, I mean, there are a lot of different ways conflict can manifest itself in open source, but a key one is, you know, I've created an open source technology. You want to accomplish something similar, but you've decided to start your own project instead of mm -hmm. using mine. And, you know, as a best practice, you should definitely try to, you know, make a single project better so that everybody in the world can benefit. But um, people have different names, companies have different names, and so do and so do nation states. And sometimes they'll want to go their own way. And I think you know to some extent that is fine. Of course, the more kind of open source best practices are understood by everyone, the more collaboration we're, we're going to have. But we'll also have people who think they know how to do it better. And to some extent, that's fine. Uh, and that's way that's one of the ways that open source is more conflictual but also more innovative because we you know can be dependent on a particular piece of software linux kernel is you know canonical example maybe um that everybody in the world relies on but we also need people to think you know perhaps hubris hubristically that they can do better and 
when you break, when you have the resources of a large corporation or even more so a nation state, sometimes, you know, big bets will be made that are seen as um, um, bad bets, I guess, by the community because you're not contributing to existing projects, perhaps. But I think, you know, in the end, that's um, that's positive. I, I, I did want to bring what kind of one idea that I think ought to be pursued to the table. And that is, I think, you know, within this conversation, we all understand that, uh, you know, a healthier open source ecosystem is going to lead to more strategic autonomy for everybody. However, it's not widely understood. So I think a key thing is how do we make that more legible, especially to policymakers. And I think the European Commission study that Open Forum Europe um, led around was a huge um, step in that direction, showing the economic impact of open source and open hardware. But I think we need a lot more in that direction. And that's going to, um, you know, at a, at a meta level, allow a lot more investment in things like, you know, uh, open sovereignty funds and policies that are friendly to global collaboration, et cetera. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mike, for that. And maybe building on that, because um, going coming back to Marco Alexander, who started this thread for me, um, but 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 when when you have been successful in getting uh, a tech sovereignty fund in, in Germany and, and perhaps therefore might be a little bit ahead of some of the other countries in the EU. Um, so building on what Mike has just said, that one of our goals should be this broader education of policymakers and politicians and, and citizens in general to understand the value of this and what we really do mean mean by open strategic digital autonomy. Um, do you have any advice or guidance or suggestions about how we can uh, you know, do that at a broader scale across Europe? Yeah, well, that's a difficult question. Uh, and why is that so? Because um, I'm on the receiving end of the information too. I'm not on the on the giving end. Um, when when we thought about how we could um, foster the, the the open source ecosystem, and um, we were pretty sure that um, obviously there's three things. Um, first this is a global ecosystem and how is a nation state or how could a regional um, a regional power like European Union be um, connected to, or can, can it be um, a single point of contact for such an ecosystem? How does that work? And we decided, okay, this is, this is, this is not something that a nation state should do. It's just something that people that understand the ecosystem, people that understand the people working with open source should do and not us. We just give the money and um, kind of give it like, um, like a, a policy push for this. And the second thing um, that we, all of us needed to understand is that open source is actually m more secure than it sounds because there, there, there are still people around, especially in the security um, area, that think that open source is open and thus insecure. And it's the other way around. And to turn the, their heads is a pretty pretty much an endeavor that you that you cannot only do from, from the outside as experts. It needs to be done by informed policymakers, as you said. Um, I think the third is to be not only to understand that problems and to understand the the, the machinations uh, and the mechanisms of the global eco uh, open source ecosystem, but to open up governmental procurement for open source. And this is something that's of utmost importance, as I think, um, because um, there is governments spend a lot of money for their software, spend a lot of money for digital solutions, and if open source um, solutions can compete with the incumbents, then we have kind of this the, 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 the biggest policy push that policymakers can actually achieve. And um, I think if we try to understand all these three and try to implement them in policies together, and just as I said, it's um, kind of, it, I'm exhaling the, the, the spirit of the German coalition coalition treaty um, of the new coalition because it's actually written in there. And um, so the, the policy, the informed policymakers have been um, doing citing calls there. Well, thank you for that. And I think that the procurement idea is one that certainly I know has come up in Ireland. I'm also involved in the Open Ireland Network trying to move the needle for open source in Ireland. And uh, that has been a common theme uh, or frustration with some folks in this area, as well as the security one in terms of people's broader understanding of, of those sort of things. So they seem to be common themes that we could all potentially work on together from a communication perspective. Um, so I, I, we're coming to the end of this panel session, unfortunately, because this, is, this has been a, a great one and we could probably go around again for more ideas. Um, but 
but I really want to say a very big thank you to all our panelists uh, for this private sector pr perspective on uh, both the challenge and the solutions uh, for, for this part of the event. So I will wrap up here for this part of the panel um, and say a big thank you to Vittorio and to Deborah and to Mike and to Mark Alexander and... Uh...